Welcome to our afternoon session. We're going to be talking about fake news. I'm going to ask some people to close the doors over there so we can actually hear what's going on, if that's all right. Um, we've got a stellar panel today to talk about one of the most contentious issues facing media in 2018. I'm going to start the introductions at the far end. Dermot Jeffries is with Al Jazeera. He is, he is the head of investigative programs there. Next in, we've got Ali Shaw from the BBC. He's the head of emerging technologies at BBC. Obviously, plays a central role on an issue like this one. Uh, next to him is Morwen Williams, who is the head of news gathering operations at the BBC. So she's at the sharp end, the reporting from the field uh, that eventually moves through the system there. Ramzi Zarife is the head of news gathering at Al Jazeera. And uh, we're also joined by Preslav Nakov, who is a senior scientist with the Qatar Computing Research Institute. Um, this is such a contentious topic that even the title of our session will be in dispute. Some people call it fake news. Some people call it manipulated content. They say the fake news, the title itself is fake news. So I just want to run very quickly through our panelists, starting with Dermot at the far end. When I say fake news to you, Dermot, what does it mean to you? I think, I think you may have to press a button on your microphone. Am I right on that? No. Or is it automatic? What button? Well, I'm not sure there is one. Yeah, it's right, right at the post, at the bottom of the post. Okay, I got it. How's that? Can you hear me? Yeah? Good. Okay. F what does fake news mean, mean to me? Um, it means uh, sitting uh, just over a year ago and watching the results of the American election coming in um, and trying to figure out what had happened. Um, it means listening to congressional testimonies from Facebook, Google, and Twitter three or four weeks ago where they described the, um, the huge range of, um, of Russian-sponsored content that appeared on their um, on their platforms in the run-up to the election. Um, it's, it means everything these days, if you, if you like. It's a, it's a, it's a, a very disturbing f phenomena, and we as journalists are struggling to, to both cope with it, to analyze it, and to understand it. Ali. So it does, at the moment, represent a cultural zeitgeist discussion around the role of media and what it means to be broadcasting content. It does represent the developments that have happened in the US and, and what's happening with elections. But also, I think, and I'm an engineer in the, I'm an engineer in the BBC, and, I, and this is what really intrigues me. I think it also represents the developments that we're seeing around how the world around it is being mediated more and more through algorithms and how those algorithms are being gamed. And so all of these things combine to represent fake news, but really the, the context is so important to have right when you're talking about this. Mormon. I, I take it at the really, the, the, the really sim simple superficial level of, is it true? And then you need one of those flow charts. Is it true? Yes, no. Uh, and and uh, do people believe it? It doesn't matter if it's true or not, but do people believe it? And, and when you, you know, that, that, I, I, I've worked very hard uh, to deliver true stories throughout my career. Before this uh, current job, I was a j uh, journalist, uh, deputy UK editor for, for a long time. And you only put out stories on the BBC if they're true. And so it really hurts when you work for the most trusted news provider that people think you don't actually do the, provide the truth. Um, so it, it's really worrying for me that, that people think we make things up. And, and the amount of times I hear particularly, you know, kids say that to me, oh, but you just make it up, don't you? I say, no, we work really hard not to make it up. Richard, I think um, for me, I mean, I follow on from what Mom has just said, it's really uh, abhorrent in a way, the phrase and the implication that we are in the business of reporting something that isn't true. I mean, I just jotted down some thoughts just on what it is that I think fake news is. And you know, it's eroding trust in the concept and value of news. Uh, I mean, its intention seems to me to be to undermine the business of truth-telling, uh, which in its purest form is what news should be. 
you know, our job is to authenticate facts, provide, shed light on the truth. And, and I think our biggest challenge to take this the next step is how to counter that, how to counter this concept that is being peddled by so many people in different ways. And is that through the use of technology and through what kind of other fight back we can have. But it, it, it's an, an abhorrence, I think, to any journalist. that uh, has emerged with a special meaning uh, uh, because of the recent elections. Um, to me, um, fake news from a technological perspective, that's the modern spam. We used to have link farms before, now we have botnets. It's just um, the social networks have put in the hands of people a technology where kind of, you know, before if you had a spam, you sh it's shared like, you kind of send a few thousand of those and then it dies. Now it can be amplified. And then you also have this kind of um, extreme personalization so that you can really target specific people and send them different messages. And from a political perspective, fake news basically means that politicians can tell different things to different people, right? And uh, then, then f again, from a technological viewpoint, I, I don't really think that much of fake news. I think of fake content on the web in general. It's there everywhere, and we have seen this in the, uh, some of the presentations earlier this morning. The way we're going to carve this session up, we're going to carve it up into two halves because there are, there are two different kinds, well, there are many different kinds, but for our purposes, we're split it into two. And for the first half of our session, roughly, I'd like to talk about the allegations of fake news against mainstream media organizations like Al Jazeera, like the BBC. Thereafter, we want to then look at the social media space and a completely different kind of industry. But, Ramsey, when politicians like a Trump, like a Duterte in the Philippines, like an Orban in Hungary, um, use that label fake news. Are they just seeking, in your view, to take down a certain story, uh, diminish the impact of that story? Are they going after the institutions? I think all of the above uh, and more. I mean, I think that what the, the White House in its current incarnation has done is throw into doubt the concept of what we do, what our profession is. Um, and I think there is an absolute clear attempt to undermine the profession, particularly if it's uh, wanting to provide credibility for yourself, in this case, the, the White House, for its own viewpoint. And I, I'll give you one example of how we were very challenged in this situation as a concrete example. Um, about two or three months ago, as you all know, Richard, the White House and Trump in particular put out an announcement that he was going to make some fake news awards, a sort of ceremony, Oscars-style ceremony for fake news awards. And we had a very long, robust debate in our newsroom about should we be covering the fake news awards? Uh, is this a, a news event in itself? Or should we, in fact, be ignoring them, saying that this is not something we even want to refer to because the whole concept is, 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 a, is false and inappropriate and pushing back against what we do every day. And in the end, we decided we wouldn't cover it. Along with many other media outlets, MSMs and others, we decided that it wasn't appropriate to be referring to something that we didn't believe was, was, was right. Um, and so we did ignore it. And in the end, it was a bit of a non-event anyway. But the point was that it, it, allowed, it, it made us much more self-reflective and allowed us to think about how are we treating this concept that's been going on now for, well, millennia, if you think fake news is propaganda or whatever else it may have been in the years before Trump. But that particular moment was a, was a, was a moment of self-reflection for us. Before, the pa before this session, I'm going to direct this question at Dermot. Um, there, we, we were discussing how we were going to get at this and what it is that media, because what we're talking about here is basically a little bit of name calling, isn't it? It's a little bit like the schoolyard, you know? And when confronted by something as juvenile as that, the mainstream media, it seems to me, haven't been able to come up with an effective, be it coordinated or ind individual response to allegations such as this from a Trump or another leader elsewhere. Dermot? Is there a way for the mainstream media to contest the fake news narrative? Um, I think there has to be. 
there are, there are absolute truths out there. There are, there are objective facts, and they are the, the, the stones on which we stand in order to do our job. And we can't forget those, and we mustn't forget those, those truths. Um, it's, the problem, I, I think, is it comes down to this, in that journalism has always taken for granted the respect, or at least the, the privilege we've been given to, to go out and question, uh, to speak truth to power, to, to challenge assumptions, and so on and so forth. And, and where this whole process has put us slightly on the back foot, because for the first time, we basically, everything that we take for granted and that we, we, we thought that our audiences have taken for granted has been challenged. And we have been very slow to react to that. Now I think that um, we have to come out, we have to come out fighting, if you like. We have to come out in defense of the values of journalism. We have to come out uh, up with solutions to the problem of, of verification and authenticity and how we define those. And we have to call a spade a spade and uh, go after those who are, who are accusing us of, of peddling mistruth, because we're not. Um, we, 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 at the moment, we're, we're, we're being very defensive about what we do, and I, and I don't think that's the way forward. Anyone else on the panel with concrete ideas on how to deal with this, on the fight back? Well, can I just say, to follow up from D what Dermot said, I think that we as a media profession tend to come together as a, as a, as a group, as a collective, in times of when, when press freedom is under fire or when we're under attack. We haven't done that when it comes to fake news yet. And I think the time to say we need to come together as a body, which we rarely do because we don't like to, because we're very competitive, and say that we need to take a stance. And I think, um, to your point earlier, uh, Richard, the, the, the fact of the matter is we're dealing with something which is propaganda and fake news, and, and it's being peddled out there. The, the reality is that if there are genuine concerns about our, our values, our judgment, our, our content, then there should be legal recourse. You know, sue us, take us to court, do what needs to be done. But don't throw around these sorts of phrases. And I think the answer has to be we need to come together in the way that we have come together in the past, dealing with major issues when the media is under fire. But isn't it a case where in, uh, here, and anybody can jump in on this, is that taking us to court is a long process, and it takes a while for an end result to arrive. In a strange, childish way, isn't this kind of name-calling and labeling actually more efficient? Uh, more effective. Well, uh, I mean, when the, the you know the leader of the Western world sort of d says something about you, then people are going to listen, aren't they? And people are going to believe him. And so he said about the BBC, "There's another beauty." Uh, and as I say, we've we've pride ourselves in in not doing any fake news. Um, so I, it it is really difficult. All he has to do is open the fader, and people will listen to him. Uh, and very, it's, it's not just. Trump, it, but it's the, the you know the attacks on the the, the stories that are uh, that, that are set that are laid out there that aren't true as well. Um, uh, but l luckily, I don't think we pick up on many of them. But there are always things that we we do pick up on. I mean, there's talk about uh, various companies. Uh, I know some of the, the big technical companies are looking at ways to, uh, and some are already doing. I think uh, ways to run your media through. Um, uh, or presumably the cloud, to, to work out whether it's true or not by, by setting it against a certain, certain level of standards. But we can't do that all the time, and I don't think the viewer and the, the, the person reading stuff on digital can do that either. And the problem is stuff gets out there so quickly, it's so easy to make the content for anybody these days that it's out there, it looks official, it's all too easy for, for somebody to produce it. You know, we did a piece... Uh, though, uh, I, I, go just, ahead. Just, just jumping in there, I, th I think that, you know, that coming up with practical solutions, verification solutions, authenticity solutions to this in terms of, 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 of being trusted providers of, of truthful news and finding a way to, 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 to um, create a seal of approval, a kite, a kite mark or something of some sort that could do that would be, would be very, very useful. Um, and it's complicated, but it's not beyond the wit of man. We've seen verification systems applied to from credit card purchases and so on and so forth, PayPal systems and all of those sort of the SSL things that you, when you actually buy something. Um, so that sort of process when you actually go and consume news, you can go to a place where, this, where you know that this is a trusted source of news. And if collectively as an industry we could create and, and embrace 
systems which will validate what we do, I think that would be provide at least some um, reassurance to our audiences that what they're seeing, if they can come to it and they know that this has got a seal of truthfulness about it, and the, the, the other stuff they're seeing doesn't have that, that could be of benefit, I think. Just a couple of points, really, just building on what you've just said. I think to try and build and develop pragmatic solutions to this, I think we first need to define the fact that this problem is not a simple one and it has a number of different modes and complications and that needs to be broken down because each one requires a slightly different intervention. And as you were talking about the name calling example, is this not just another form of efficient name calling? It just struck me that pre-social media, pre-internet, if this sort of allegation had been made against professional media, what would we have done? Our journalists would, carry the, would have carried on doing what they do and try to maintain our editorial rigor and the editorial quality that we have, and we would have refuted it based on the output that we generate. I think, so on, on one level, there is a little bit, I think, of just riding this wave and holding your standards high. So if you are professional, just hold your standards high. And we talked about values, and I think values has to be at the heart of what we're talking, whatever the practical answers might be. I think on the technological front, then there's really understanding that this, uh, this issue is exacerbated and amplified because of the nature of the technology and the way that people are consuming media and the way that it's reaching all of us. And that immediacy of comment, the immediacy of watching, um, the fact that it's all algorithmically driven. Um, Harun's piece was so instructive, so the previous talk, the first half of that, the fact that even if you have done everything journalistically that you can to put out great content, your content can still be gained, and he was showing us the uh, most watched and most popular news stories, can be gained from outside of your domain. What that should tell us all is the limits of the technology and the way we are deploying it. We really need to understand algorithms are not a panacea, they have limits. And the more editorially and technically we work together on understanding those limits, the better we become in engineering ourselves. So I think we need to start to engineer not just for success and reach and making our content freely available, but really need to engineer for those moments in, in ways that the algorithm might fail. How might we be um, manipulated if we get this approach slightly wrong? We need to think about that way. Start to think about the different ways that people might want to approach fake news and, and try and, and take derail the, uh, the output that we are generating. And it's a very complicated issue, and I think um, the process is really about uh, iterating through this, and working together and iterating through this, because across our organizations, we probably have different domains of expertise that we can all bring to this. I, I think that the, the root of the problem, I, I, I don't think that the problem is that much that the president is giving the fake news awards. The problem is that there are actually people that believe in those awards. And the fact is that the internet space, space and basically kind of the social media have already uh, divided into two parts. They don't, if you look kind of at, at the structure, they don't talk much to each other. And um, actually there are people, and, and because of the filtering bubble that is being um, uh, formed around those people due to the extreme personalization that the, uh, those social media are creating, there are people that live in their echo chambers. There are people that are living in their filtering bubbles. There are people that are only reading some particular kinds of media. They are getting more and more of the same, more and more of the same. They cannot stop eating. It is like candy for children. And they kind of start believing. They kind of live in their own parallel reality. And then, then you just have a president that tells them what they already believe. This is, to me, the uh, fundamental problem. Mm. And, and kind of telling, telling back, no, 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 we are the real news, this is not solving the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is that people live in their filtering bubbles. And, and kind of, to me, technology has created the problem, and we need a technological solution. Of course, with all other uh, kinds of solutions as well. Can I, uh, Rich, just pick up on something, Mike? Can I, can you hear me? Yeah. Can I just pick something on what Dermot uh, mentioned, which I think is, I understand the value here where technology can help us with uh, ways and means of verifying whether a piece of information or, or something that we've put out there is, is a truth or not. But my concern is the idea of a verification process or some kind of gold star, blue tick, whatever you want to call it, um, is fine in one sense, but I would say that the most important thing here is brand integrity. You know, we, uh, in my case here, Al Jazeera, the BBC, you know, we stand by our brand and we build our entire operation around that brand 
and what that stands for. Um, so to then have to that go and seek another element of operational um, verification to, to provide people, viewers, in any way in which they're consuming our content with some sort of guarantee that what they're reading is, is valid and true seems to me to run counter to what we are, which is an organization which by its very nature should be a brand that is trusted and understood and respected. I think there's a dilemma there in wanting to m maintain your own brand integrity and at the same time have to look for some sort of technical uh, rubber stamping. I mean, yeah. just, just, just to come back on that, I mean, I think that's, that's uh, I agree with you, and it, it's not the sole answer. It's just, it's, it's a way of basically identifying trustworthy news sources. I mean, I think the, but one of the most powerful tools we have at our disposal is to do what we do best, which is, which is to be our own propagandists, if you like, to, to, to keep reinforcing the significance and the importance of valid and truthful news at current affairs. It's, it's, we, we need to, to tell that story and be more polemical. We need to be evangelists and ambassadors for what we do, much more than we have been. We've taken it for granted that our audience trusted us. Now it's coming under challenge. Now we need to be more, much more proactive in telling people why brands like the BBC, why Al Jazeera, the Washington Post, the New York Times, whatever, these, you know, whatever you think about the political um, uh, 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 coverage that they do or the opinions that they put forward, when it comes down to, 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 to fact-based journalism, that these are, these are um, trustworthy sources because this is why we're doing it. This is, this is what our job is, and we need to explain that and just to be, be more forthcoming about it and not be so defensive. So um, about trust, uh, even people that are engaged in uh, manipulation and, and spread uh, fake news, even they re recognize the importance of the brand. So, for example, when uh, the, the spread of this information and uh, uh, the whole blockade started here in Qatar, they have, the hackers have decided to spread the information not through kind of anonymous uh, tweets, but by hacking recognized brands. So brands are important. Sorry? No, okay. Um, and um, so in terms of trust, right? So when we are using SSL, there is a certificate. There is some kind of uh, certificate that we are trusting this website so we can kind of, you know, uh, communicate with it in a secure manner. So the idea of having similar kind of trust certificate when you're reading something, when you're accessing a particular article or a particular medium from a technological viewpoint, it doesn't sound that crazy. If you think of Twitter, Twitter used to have uh, those verified accounts, checkbox, and interestingly, they have discontinued them and they have discontinued them exactly because they have given one of those uh, uh, trust uh, verified account indicators to um, a fake event that has been created uh, and, and, and you know by a fake account and all that. So basically, the response was that they just discontinued it. But now it looks like the Twitter, together with uh, Microsoft and Facebook, they have a second thought, and um, uh, they have recently uh, announced the introduction of. Um, trust indicators together with uh, a third party organization, the University of uh, Santa Clara. So basically the idea is to um, associate with each article and also with each medium um, some information about how the information has been verified in this particular article, what is the ownership structure of this particular medium, uh, what is the verification process, things about the author of the article, things that kind of journalists normally do. And um, they have already kind of uh, newspapers like Washington Post already has started like using those kinds of trust indicators. And I think that's uh, um, kind of a move in the right direction. So again, if you are thinking of technological solutions, I think we have to, there's a lot that we can learn from journalists. And the most important thing is they look at the sources. They look at the sources. So kind of if you want a solution, it is going to fact check every single tweet, every single news. We just cannot, we don't have that much time. We don't have that, that much even computer power. But if you go and you look for after the source, is this website even kind of one of the main ones? Uh, or is it some, something anonymous? Can you even kind of find out where it is based? All these kind of things. Um, Consider the source is lesson one in journalism 101 uh, in the field. That's what journalists are supposed to do. Uh, and it's also something the news consumers are supposed to do, and there isn't enough of that, is there? Uh, I did want to split this into mainstream media and then get to the social media, but of course the social media then bled into this part because it's such an integral part of it. 
Some people would say that social media created the problem. I don't agree. I think it exacerbated it. The e news ecosystems that people talk about are really ecosystems, and people find their comfort zones and they stay there. As we move on to social media, um, I didn't really quite get how easy it is to fake news until I spoke to Dermot about an hour ago, and he told me about his own little adventure, creating his own little CNN. Why don't you share that story? Well, it was, it was an experiment that, um, an experiment that we, we covered for a film we did recently, looking into this phenomenon. Um, it's very, very simple. We, um, um, this guy, Larry Kim, who's a marketing consultant, set up this, uh, in front of our cameras, set up this uh, thing called Citizens News Network. He decided just to come up with a fake name for a, 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 a news site. He created a website based upon this, um, which is just a web page. Um, from that web page, he created a Facebook page. He posted um, a fake news story onto his website and then linked it through to his Facebook page. The fake news story was a recycled one about um, how a Donald Trump, uh, a protester at a Donald Trump rally, a rally had been supposed to be paid for attending that rally by opponents of Donald Trump. He posted this um, on his Facebook and then he took out a 50 pound Facebook ad to promote this. Um, and, and he targeted it, which you can do because of the way the, the Facebook ad processes work. He targeted this at, at people who were predisposed towards this kind of news, you know, for instance, the Republican voters and so on and so forth, all of which information is available to people who purchase Facebook ads. Um, and he pressed the button, and within an hour, he had 10,000 hits. Now, that's extraordinary and terrifying, and it was absolutely not monitored by, by anyone in the social in Facebook. Um, all they seemed to care about, even though there are supposedly checks and balances, all they seemed to care about was the fact that they got their $50. Um, and it's, it's, let's not forget that there's a, monetary, there's a monetary process involved here in these exchanges, and that's one of the, the key drivers of the way and one of the, the problems we face as, as legitimate media is the fact that, that, is that the, the barriers against us are, are, are industries which are driven by a desire to make very large sums of money. Ali, um, we discussed on mainstream media what mainstream media can do to preserve their own reputations. Whose job is it to fix the fake news problem on social media? Where does the responsibility lie for that? Well, thanks for landing me with that no. question. Well, really I'll, no, I'll just throw something at you. Um, you know, U.S. Congress has made some noise on this, but that's all they've done, is made noise. They've taken no legislative steps. We know the Germans have taken legislative steps on against uh, Facebook, or there were fines issued. Uh, uh, EU, France, Germany are leading the way on that, um, saying that these social media platforms need to get this under control, not just fake news, but also hate speech. So that's legislators, that's regulators. Is that where the solution lies, or does it lie elsewhere? So I'll, gi I'll give you my frank perspective, which is not policy, in my personal opinion. I think, again, the answer is a range of interventions are necessary, and regulation has one, legislation has one role to play. What we do in our own organizations is really important. We have to decide what we stand for and how we're going to act. The social media companies, the technology companies ha also have to evolve. We, you know, we forget, I mean, the BBC is 96 years old. Some of these companies are only three, four, five years old, right? but they're having global impact. So they're growing up in this very public, very impactful way. So they, they've got a way to go. And then citizens, right? So uh, we all have a responsibility, not only to edu educate citizens about these changes that are going on, but for citizens to really recognize what's happening all around them, how uh, access to information can be manipulated. And across those different things, so if you look at in, in Europe, GDPR is coming in. Uh, within GDPR, there are stipulations around the right to access to information and awareness about what data is held about you. That's really going to force lots of corporations to really think twice about how they are holding citizen data, what they're doing with that. Um, I, I don't think regulation, heavy regulation, is always the answer. Um, because I think the second st um, step around what we as corporations might do, well, I'm a technologist, right? So really, I'm thinking about what are the sorts of tools and services that might help journalists to make sense of the information world that's going on around them, but also be really careful that those very tools and services that we provide don't become part of the problem. Well, we've seen very easily through Harun's examples about how the technology itself is just a tool and can be manipulated either way. And then when it comes to education, well, actually, this was just me cribbing for this panel, really, uh, looking at what the BBC editorial had done. And the BBC took a very low-tech approach to this, sent our journalists out to schools just to educate. 
And that, that's one of the ways that we should be doing this. We should just make sure we keep reinforcing what it is to live in a information-centric world. That's what we need to do. Yes. So that's picking up on that point, what we do is we've got some... Am I working? We've got something called School Report. There we go. Something called School Report. We go out and take some of our journalists out and go and educate school kids. And, and we get them to make films, but also we give them a bit of the spiel about what, what you best do uh, to, to make, make a good story. And that involves telling the truth about it. Now, we can't get it to all the schools, but it's been running for about, I don't know, 10 years at least. And so by that time, we get around quite a few schools. So if we can just influence a, a few of the, of, of the children out there, the next generation, then maybe they, they will realise that there's a different narrative going on here. And, and maybe they will be a bit more sceptical. But, it, you know, it's very easy to be taken in. One of the things, it, it, in a busy newsroom, we were taken in with a, a Sky News drop on Twitter, Sky News breaking news. Um, that uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen's husband, had died. And it was exactly as it would have been had Sky News tweeted that. Totally false account. It just looked like the Sky News one. And one quick call to Buckingham Palace, who luckily uh, found it uh, not amusing, but w understood why we were ringing. And another one to the head of ops at Sky News saying, have you been hacked? Um, soon got it. But there was a flurry in our newsroom for five minutes. But we, we didn't go on air with that. Other people might have gone on there with that. I'm, I'm not, not saying anybody here, but if it or it would have retweeted it or seen it, and, mm. and then it just explodes if that happened. Sky got it down via Twitter really quickly there. I, I would add that I think that, that the fast paced move technologically is allowing, and the sophistication is allowing it to be increasingly easy to be hoodwinked, yeah. um, to be taken in, to use your phrase. And, and, and that's obviously incredibly dangerous um, at the source in a newsroom to be hoodwinked. I would say a couple of other things, Richard. You mentioned regulation, and we've talked about regu regulation can only go so far. You know, it's not an, a, a one-size-fits-all solution. I think there are obviously online solutions that can help us, but I think fundamentally being old-fashioned and saying that there are offline solutions. We've already talked about the schools project here. I feel that the part of the reason why so-called fake news has been allowed to proliferate and establish itself so much and this is not the, the only reason, but one reason may be that there is an increasing evacuation of the news gathering editorial space in towns and cities and villages and places where there is a gap that can be plugged by anybody where we don't have the resources. And I think the, 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 the desire of by the, on the part of networks and organizations in the media to pull back, to retrench, to shut down, to, to decide they don't need to operate in Detroit or um, anywhere else but go all the way back to New York and focus their resources there, there is an implication because a space opens up and you don't have those boots on the ground, which is a very old-fashioned response to a very modern problem we're facing. But I think that it goes some way to addressing this problem is if you're out there in, in, with your own eyes and ears in the middle of nowhere, then you're, you've got much less chance of being taken in by fake news. We'll try to get the questions on the floor before we wrap up this session. If you do have a question, put your hand up, and the gentleman with the microphone in the corner will get the microphone to you. So hands up if there are questions, please. Can yes, I'm coming to you, Preslav, because <laughs> my question was, technology didn't necessarily get us into this problem. It exacerbated this problem. But do you think technology is the thing that gets us out? Well, I mean, I think I have mentioned earlier that uh, technology is in part responsible for the problem, so it should be part of the solution. So I have mentioned also earlier the metaphor of uh, thinking of fake news as the modern spam. We didn't never manage exactly to uh, eradicate spam, but we have kind of, we are limiting its spread to some extent. And uh, it's very similar uh, to what, what we can do with, with the fake news. So, um, of course, the problem is much worse because the spam, it, lim it kind of limits a few thousand people and ends there. And kind of while fake news that are really viral, they are going to be reshared and reposted. And maybe you reach a few thousand people. Eventually, maybe this kind of reaches millions, right? And, and potentially kind of there's, there's a space to go to billions of users. There are like more than two billion uh, users of, of those of those uh, uh, networks. So one problem is uh, okay. In, in addition to the to the technological solution, part of the problem is actually economical. So there are people that are making fake news. Um, it's not only Russians. It's not it's not only the outright. There are also kind of those guys in Macedonia. There are people that are doing it just for the money, just like just like with the spam, right? So now the question is, if you make it economically, 
kind of not acceptable, right? But then, then, then this is going to be, you know, part of the solution. And the problem is that the um, social media companies don't really have the incentive of solving the problem. Why? Because first of all, those people are probably paying money to, to post these advertisements in the, in the social network. Second of all, um, the more it is reposted, the more heated the debate becomes, the more polarization, the more time people are going to spend on those kind of social media, the more advertisement they're going to see, the more money for the social network companies. Why are they going to solve the problem? I mean, they're going to solve the problem for two reasons. First, if there is a pressure from the legislation, as we have mentioned. Second, if there is an economic pressure from the advertisers. If there is an advertiser that says, I don't want my advertisement next to a, to a hate speech, and this has happened. I mean, the next step can be, I don't want my advertisement next to a fake news. And then, if they start losing money, they are going to, to, to start doing something, something about the problem. Um, and then, um, in terms of, again, if, if you're coming back to the metaphor of spam, right, you can control it at different stages. You can actually, um, you can make it harder for kind of, for example, Twitter is not allowing anymore posting the same message from multiple accounts. Right? This is kind of stopping something at the beginning. Facebook doesn't really kind of, they have algorithms to flag what might be fake, then they have verification process, and then they kind of have some indicators. Oh, this is probably kind of the uh, disputed content. And then uh, when, at the moment when you want to share it, they are going to tell you, okay, look, this is, this is probably not, this is probably fake news. Do you, do you still want to share it? It turns out that people kind of share it less. So this kind of works. They say that this kind of limits the spread by 80%, which is, which is a lot. Um, I'm going to have to cut yeah, you off there because okay. we've got just another minute to go. Um, the case study that Preslav was referring to was Unilever, which is one of the world's biggest advertisers, went to Facebook and said, we, you need to fix your hate speech problem. Uh, we don't want our ads sitting next to this ugliness. But I think it's notable, Ali, that they didn't say you need to fix your fake news problem, you need to fix the hate problem. If lesson number one in journalism is consider the source, lesson number two is follow the money. Is that the way that this gets fixed, ultimately, that big money advertisers threaten to pull their money out of these social media platforms and force them to look at their bottom lines and do the right thing? What was that? Yeah, Sorry. I thought I'd throw that at you. Um, so, so I think this is an evolving story, right? I mean, it's an evolving debate, and people are trying to navigate the way through. And, and it's quite right that if you don't want your brand associated with something that's uh, hateful content or hurtful stories, that you would go out and reach out to the people who are, who are mediating that experience for you and say, this isn't good for me, this is not good for my customers or my audience members. And as, as this story evolves around fake news and, and uh, what is objective truth, fact versus not, I think we are gonna end up in similar conversations. But I think what I'm struck through this conversation is that there's certain things that um, span the technical and editorial divide, certain values that span those divides that are coming together now. So you know, things like what trust means, what does it mean to be impartial, to be unbiased, to be accountable, those are terms that all my editorial colleagues on, on this panel would be very familiar with. But they're also the terms that are now, just now, starting to be discussed in conferences around machine learning uh, and by engineers who are really trying to understand, well, what do we do about an algorithm? How do we make it accountable? How do we actually understand what's going on? And the fact that those words are st slowly starting to collide, I think is a good thing. I think, in fact, we need to accelerate those because when that moment comes when you need to go and talk to that corporation to say, why is it that you are promoting content that is not factually correct? It's a lot easier if you've really also understood, well, how is it that they are generating their services? How is the algorithm and the automation really working? I'm getting the rap cue. I wish we had more time for this, but I'd like to thank our panelists, Preslav Nakov, Ramzi Zarife, Morwin Williams, Ali Shah, Dermot Jeffries. And we'll see you at the gala dinner tonight. Thank you.